Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Everyone, let's uh, uh, let's return to our seats. Um, okay, so. Yeah, Matthias. <laughs> Matthias, stay at the front. <laughs> okay, so now we have Matthias Troyer. Uh, welcome back after lunch. Matthias Troyer is going to speak to us about uh, classical versus quantum annealing. So we'll just turn it over to Matthias. Thank you. And I first want to clarify one thing, namely people were confused this week, whether I'm a physicist or an engineer or a computer scientist. And I have documented evidence from UCSB that I'm an experimental marine biologist. And they even added some music to that. But I'm not talking about, uh, that's me, yes. That's me doing science. And, uh, but, but I, I will not talk, uh, talk of this, but I talk about about, about no, yeah, quantum uh, needling. And before I go there, I want to ask if anybody here is not familiar with what a quantum annealer is or what the D-Wave device is, or have you all heard me talk 20 times on that? If there's somebody who is not familiar, they should shout. Because I talk on recently work that I would call is D-Wave inspired. See, it's, it's, it's recent papers and, and recent work in progress. And on Wednesday, I showed already the slide about what D-Wave is. It's a quantum annealer. It solves the Cuba problem or the spin glass problem. And one key result is that we so far could not observe any evidence for quantum speed up in a quantum annealer. And one question that I want to answer is why that might be the case. In the basic question in quantum uh, annealing is can we solve a an, an optimization problem faster by quantum uh, tunneling through a barrier than by the, the classically going over it. But one can do more. One can also simulate the quantum mechanical tunneling through it. And in the, the, the case of the, 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 the icing spin glass, you take the, 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 the problem Hamiltonian and code it. The, the, with qubits, you add the, 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 the transverse field, you start with a the, the strong transverse field, you adiabatically change it, you ramp down the field, you ramp up the couplings, and you find the ground state of your problem. You can do that in many different versions, in the ground state coherently a Theoretically, that's the the the, 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 the quantum a the theoretic method. By adding others, you can do it at the find the temperature in experiments faster and so on. That's quantum annealing. Uh, it's it's the flexible approach. You do something like it and hope you win. You can also simulate it on a classical computer, and that we call simulated quantum annealing. Like we, but that's where Eddie has a problem when I call it that way. <laughs> so let me show you that simulated quantum annealing can actually mean many different things. It's just I'm doing something like quantum annealing on a classical computer. It's a classical algorithm. Just like quantum Monte Carlo is a classical algorithm, which people in quantum information hate that we misrepresent it as quantum Monte Carlo is actually classical. So here, one thing you might think of when you do, when you simulate a quantum annealer, you could think you actually simulate the quantum annealer. 
So you simulate either the t t unitary evolution or the, 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 the uh, open systems dynamics of the quantum annealer. You can also do a simulation of something that mimics quantum uh, annealing, for example, you think think Monte Carlo dynamics. And one should just be clear what we mean. And I will show the evidence later that one can learn things about a quantum annealer from a simulated quantum annealer. But a simulated, quantum, a simulated quantum annealing can refer to many things. If you want to say it is unitary quantum annealing, then I would call it U dash QA. That's my proposal. Or an open system. I have here many different acronyms for you. That's what the, <laughs> this slide is about. So when I talk about simulated quantum annealing, then I will mostly mean QMC QA. Yeah. Shin, Small and Smith, I call that. Monte Carlo quantum annealing, or a mean field quantum annealing, or you could call it MFQMC, <laughs> QA, or whatever. But it can, can, uh, in many, I just I do something, I do some algorithm, and it's not a quantum annealer that I simulate, but I do a simulation of something that is like quantum annealing. Like quantum Monte Carlo is not a quantum algorithm, but it's, but it's Monte Carlo of a quantum system. So well, I think as long as we're clear what we mean, that's good. But I will now make statements based on quantum Monte Carlo about what a quantum annealer might do. And, that's the, and that I have to later show you why that actually makes sense. But first, when we compare the, 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 the D-Wave to, to an like, Intel chip from the, 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 the same generation, we look at the runtimes just for the pure kneeling, uh, the times are comparable. I don't care about the fact a thousand faster or slower. It's comparable, that's quite good. But it's, it's not the interesting question. The interesting question is more how do the times to solutions scale. And if we look just at the intrinsic times and look, for example, at the, 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 the typical instance, so at the, the, the median here, then the scaling for large problem instances, or also for the higher quantize, it's similar for a classic annealer and for D-Wave. If we then calculate the speed up, then we see that for the, the typical instance, the ratio of the scale of the times is about constant. For the harder instances, the higher quantile, there's some slowdown. And that's bad news. I wanted to really see a speed up because that would have been exciting. But the interesting question that I want to address now is why did we not see the speed up that we expected? And it could be due to the, the, the calibration errors. It could just be that we looked at the wrong problems. We might have looked at the problems for which there just is no quantum speed up and we should, look, should have looked at better problems. It might have been due to bad qubits, or it's just a bad machine, as some people claim. But basically, the ultimate question that bothered me is why did Monte Carlo simulations published previously show evidence for quantum annealing outperforming classical annealing when we did not see that on D-Wave? They showed that when you run the quantum Monte Carlo simulated quantum annealing, you find a low energy state faster with better scaling than a classical annealer. On D-Wave, we did not see that. We did not even see that in our quantum Monte Carlo simulation. So there was a problem here. So when we looked at, at the, 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 the scaling for the, the, the native problems on D-Wave, we found that with quantum Monte Carlo and, and, and with the D-Wave, the scaling was similar. For the hardest problems, we never found the ground state. The, the others is scaled in roughly the same way. We also so never found it with quantum Monte Carlo, by the way. Yes? Different times correspond to what? Two different quantiles. Green is the median time. Red is the 95th percentile. Black, the 99th. Dark blue, the first percentile. So you see there's a huge spread as well by, by factors of 10,000 and more between the easy problem and the hard ones. And the scaling is a bit steeper 
for the quantum approaches. Okay, sorry, that's my wife who wants to talk to me, but she has to wait. <laughs> and, it's <laughs> and it's narrower and it's better scaling with classical annealing. So this is, these are. Uh, these are the time to solution, uh, the time to find the solution with 99% probability. Time to find the solution with 99% probability. Mean time, is, time looks similar. And we see that it's worse with quantum model color QA. I made it explicit for Eddie <laughs> and, and for the classical annealing. I need to. And here's the evidence why it should have been better. They looked at the 2D spin glass. They found that, uh, okay, that's a big instance. They lowered, no, they uh, annealed it with a classical annealer here in black, open, uh, the closed circles with the quantum annealer, the open circles. And they found the energy drops down much faster and it scales better with the simulated quantum annealer. They even called it QA, quantum annealing, Eddie. So that was why we believe that it's actually better because there was this evidence. Now, they showed already that for, okay, but this is not what we saw on D-Wave. They showed already that for uh, the, the, the three set problem, it looks different for three set. The classical uh, annealing is better than the simulated quantum uh, annealing. And we wanted to understand that, and there were three differences. First of all, they looked at a slightly different lattice. They ran it slightly differently with a slightly different algorithm on a single instance. We, we compared it, we checked it using their algorithm on their instance, we totally reproduce it. And we found out what happens. And for that, I need to explain how we do, to do quantum Monte Carlo. When we do classical Monte Carlo, we have a, a, a lattice, the spins, we flip them randomly and sample the, 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 the partition function and we slowly cool down the system. When we do quantum Monte Carlo, the partition function is not just the sum over classical configurations, but we can map it to an the path integral, take many copies of them, and the weight of a configuration of the path integral is that of a three-dimensional Ising model. So quantum Monte Carlo means we do classical Monte Carlo on the, 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 the path integral, which are the configurations now of a 3D instead of a 2D Ising model. And that we can do, and when we do it that way, then it works beautifully. But in order to, to do it, one used to discretize the imaginary time direction with some time step. And the argument was always the universal properties of your system should not depend on the value of the time step. This is an irrelevant perturbation. If you go to a critical point, that should not matter. So here, the, the solution about why things differed comes up immediately when you start looking. Okay, it, it was not immediately, it was after a few months once we started looking at what is the dependence on the time step that we choose and what happens when we take more and more and more finer time slices. And here I show the performance of the quantum and of the simulated quantum annealer at the fixed temperature as we are changing the number of time slices. When it's just one, then it's very bad. We take more and more and more, and we get to about 20. That's the, this line here. This is what they saw before, and it goes down rapidly. But then we can increase it further. When we increase it further, and we take smaller and smaller and smaller time steps, it gets better and better and better and better at first, and gets stuck. We get down faster to some good state, and then we get stuck. Now, what that tells you is, okay, this is also, and this is also what we 
on D wave. And when we compared, we took a tiny, tiny time, st time step, and we saw the classic annealer was working worse than, no, sorry, the classic annealer was working better than D wave and better than the quantum Monte Carlo. So now, this does not tell you that the results are wrong, but there are just two different ways of running a simulated quantum annealer. If you want to run it as a classical optimization algorithm, then that gives you a way to actually optimize the performance of this classical algorithm. If you want to go to as low uh, energy as possible, then you should not use a tiny time step, you should use a large time step. How can we understand that? How can a large time step a, a, a large total time step, how can that improve the performance of the algorithm over that of a physical system? And the answer is simple. Let's introduce here for the room a time step of 10 seconds and I will quantum tunnel through the wall. Because during the time step I ask you to close your eyes. And when you open the eyes again after one time step I'll be outside. And I've walked through a closed door. <laughs> Close your eyes. <laughs> yeah. So that, that's what's going on. By having the large time step, I can flip multiple spins at once between the one replica and the next ones. And I don't have to build up the intermediate state that would cost energy on the top of the barrier. But I can go through it in one time step. That makes for a better classical algorithm, but this is a trick that I cannot reproduce in a physical device, or I can, because the large time step basically means I'm doing it with the uh, Hamiltonian, which here would be one which has a multiple spin flip term. But with local spin flips, I can't I have to go through a state that's in the barrier and pay the penalty. Classically, in Monte Carlo, I can avoid that by taking a large time step. And if we then optimize the temperature and the time step size, then we get that the best scaling of the simulated quantum annealer is better than that of the classical annealer. But if we go to the physical limit of the time step going to zero, then this is the performance of the quantum annealer. Okay, it drops down a bit faster, but then it's, it flattens out, and the classical annealer ultimately scales better. Now, it was argued by Katzgraber and by D-Wave later also that for 2D spin glass, one would never have expected a quantum speed up. Now, that's surprising because D-Wave also used them to show their speed up. But we learn, we all learn, and indeed 2D spin glasses might be a bad choice because in a 2D spin glass the critical temperature is zero, meaning a tiny bit of energy that you add, a little bit of temperature, allows you to escape a minimum, and so the barriers are probably not very high, and when the, they are not very tall, the barriers, then one can get out efficiently thermally. The argument then was if one goes to a 3D spin glass, with a large critical temperature and tall barriers that are, that are extensive, that should be the point where you should look for quantum speed up. We didn't see it on D-Wave. And in the simulations, in 3D, unfortunately, we see the same. The classical annealing is here the red curve, and the quantum Monte Carlo annealers all get stuck and ultimately scale worse. So the lessons learned here. It's simulated quantum annealing can not only refer to different algorithms, but even for quantum Monte Carlo, we can perform it in two different ways. We can either cheat, take a large time step. We have a quantum-inspired classical algorithm that outperforms the quantum Monte Carlo in the physical limit. So if you want to have a good classical optimization algorithm, use the large time step. If you want to 
predict what a quantum device might do that does quantum annealing, let the time step go to zero. We're still looking for problems that show quantum speed up in that case. But now we know exactly how we should look for something that shows potential. Second part, heavy tails. You saw this big spread of effect of 10,000 and more for the quantum annealing. Yeah? Yeah. Here's a question, yes. Um, did you try adding multi-spin flip terms to small time steps for QMC and see if it helped? It should help, yes. Have you tried it? No. Okay. Because effectively we have them in. The big time step is a multi flip that's pretty Yes. Cool. So uh, we well, could add it. It should help. If you or somewhere else, then you could put multi-spin flip terms in the Hamiltonian. Yes. We have Calculated that yes, it helps, but it helps only by constant. As long as you add only, uh, yeah, and 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 then you you have the two qubit coupler and a three qubit coupler. Then it, it helps, yes. Now, this huge scatter here, because we care about solving hard problems. And now I show just at one size here where we can still solve it always with quantum Monte Carlo, the distribution of how many times I have to run the simulated uh, annealer or simulated quantum annealer to actually find the ground state. This is not for the biggest problem sizes, but for something with 288 spins. It's, it has a like, power law tail, this the log scales here. And there's one instance where I need to do about 10,000 repetitions with the classical annealer. The typical one is about order 10. The easy ones are order 1. When, you, when I give you a random problem, you don't know whether it's hard or easy. So if you want to solve all of them, or most of them, then you should assume it might be hard and you have to run them all 10,000 times. Because we don't know how to actually predict whether it's easy or hard. With the simulated quantum uh, uh, needle and we see the same scaling on D wave, we find that the hardest instance we had to run about a few billion times to find the ground state. That's the hardest out of 10,000. So okay, it's quite hard, but it's not extremely hard. The hardest test out of 1,000 that's about here, you still have to run it about a million times. The easy problem is you run once, boom, you're there. So what should you do to improve it? You have to run it slower to find it, right? To get more adiabatic. Or actually not. One can also try to run it faster. And here's what happens when one runs it faster. When we run it faster, and now we run it about 66 times faster, we do just 150 updates per spin, so extremely fast. Yes, we never solve it in one step anymore. We have to attempt it at least twice. The typical one also goes up for maybe f five to six times repetitions, but I'm doing much faster ones. And the surprising result is that the hard, okay, this is now for just, for just 200, where it was easier to play with, instead of 10 million repetitions, the hard one succeeds in about 20,000 repetitions. So when we run it faster, we run it 66 times faster, and for the hardest test problem of 10,000, we actually need 688 times fewer repetitions that are each 66 times faster for a speed up of nearly 50,000. So what that tells us is that it, it's more than just saying we have to run it adiabatically slowly, but one has to think a bit more about what one is doing and think kind of what is the, the, the best schedule. And the hard problems, they're just stuck in some local minimum. I run into it and then have to tunnel out of it into the true global minimum. And there are two ways of doing that. One way is to run it much, much slower to be adiabatic, maybe at much lower temperature with much better qubits, to really adiabatically tunnel through this hard barrier. 
Or the other way is I just run it fast and I just kick it out of the minimum and it has a better chance of finding the true count state. And a similar results were found by the and his collaborators. So one should run it faster. And you have to find out you know, what is the best way of running it. But don't run it adiabatically slowly. That's one lesson we learned. The other interesting thing is when you look at the tails, the, they can either be finite, they can be exponential, or have this power law, which is characterized by an exponent psi here. And we plot now how that changes as a function of problem size. And we see that as we go up in the problem size for the classical uh, nila, it gets close to about a half and slightly bigger. Now a half means the power is about two. It's like a one over psi. And when it reaches one, then it means that the variance is no longer defined because the second moment diverges. So you can't just sample and get the mean time because the mean time has an infinite error. But, but what's worse is when it gets above one, which for the quantum annealer here happens at the size of about 72 already, then the mean time is not defined anymore because the first moment the mean actually diverges. Meaning if you were to, to calculate the mean time, it's totally dominated by the hardest instance and the mean is infinite. So that's why we, we plot always the, 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 the median and not the mean. But if the hardest instance is dominated, then that's bad news. But when you run it faster, then we see that actually the tails are very similar. They are heavy, but it's not worse with quantum annealing than with classical annealing. This is this psi parameter. It's the, it, the that's one over the power in the distribution function. So when it's one, we don't have the mean anymore. So it looks better here. There's still those hard instances, extreme events, but it's now the same here. So one has to look at these tails and not just at the median and going slowly might not be optimal. That was the second lesson we learned. We have to really to, 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 to optimize the annealing times for the hard problems. So with that we can now think of, of which problems and which design and which hardware graph could be good to actually see quantum speed up. But then, okay, and that's what we're trying and we're still looking for problems that have quantum speed up. And looking for that and not finding such problems and, and finding that all the problems we're trying actually have problems, one starts worrying. And one way out could be if quantum Monte Carlo doesn't tell you anything about reality. So then people ask us, okay, okay, yeah, you don't find any quantum speed up with quantum Monte Carlo, but what does quantum Monte Carlo have to do with the real time evolution of a quantum system? And at first sight, it has nothing to do with it. The one is I stochastically sample a path integral. I do the, the, the stochastic updates. The other is I take a wave function that I evolve coherently and that is totally different dynamics. And yes, I completely agree. It's very different dynamics for the same physical system. And I'm arguing this that for the problems with, with high barriers, there is a deep relationship and that relationship comes from the fact that going through a barrier, going from one side, going from here to here and tunneling through it, is rate limited by the same physics. Namely, I have the same quantum system. I have to go through that barrier, I have to tunnel through, 
And it's the tunneling process that limits the time I need. And, it, and it's the same rate limiting physics in the quantum of the color dynamics and in the, 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 the quantum annealer. One might argue that at a quantum critical point, that's done by Sandvik, he says, at the quantum critical point, we know that quantum Monte Carlo has a different dynamic exponent than the physical system. And that's correct. Yes, I fully agree. And we designed quantum Monte Carlo methods to actually equilibrate faster than the physical system. But what's more important here is that we're not sitting at a quantum critical point and looking at the long time dynamics, but we want to go just through a barrier. And when you look at the spin glass, then at first you have a quantum critical point as a function of the, 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 the transverse field that separates the paramagnet from the spin glass phase. And there, the gap closes typically with the power law. But then inside the spin glass phase, there are more level crossings or void level crossings with an exponentially closing gap. And those are the hard bottlenecks that we have to go through. We have to really tunnel through a barrier with an exponentially small gap. And this has nothing to do with the quantum critical point. And so what we now wanted to look at what is the relationship between the tunneling through such a barrier in quantum Monte Carlo compared to the, the unitary the dynamics. In the quantum system, we know the time goes like 1 over the gap squared. What happens in quantum Monte Carlo? And the first problem we looked at was just just the ferromagnet. We looked at the chain. We looked at the cluster that we coupled. And said, OK, what is the time that I need to go from all spins up to the spins flipping down from one side to the other there of the barrier? And how does it scale? And the splitting between the states is the gap. We calculate the gap. And we know how the physical dynamic scales. In quantum Monte Carlo, I have my word line. And I tunnel not by flipping the spins and paying, uh, paying, the, paying the gap energy. I start by flipping them just for a very short time interval. Uh, when I do it as a uh, particle in a t t t t double well, I flip, f I jump from the right to the left and back, and I create a kink and then I get t t an entire kink, kink here in the t t t t t t word lines. And the rate limiting factor is I have to create this instant on and the, t the entire t t t t instant on. And then now measure the time I need to actually go into that transition state. And then check how it scales. And here is the data for various system sizes, various strength of the transverse field. The open symbols are the time scale that comes from the quantum Monte Carlo. The closed symbols is 1 over the gap squared. And the agreement, it's just the same scaling. So in this problem, the scaling is the same in quantum Monte Carlo as for the physical dynamics. And it's basically, I'm here. Here in the one of the minima. And I jump over with the kink and the end the kink. And they pay the cost of two instantons. I have to go there and I have to go back because I have to close the trace in imaginary time. And that gives me then the delta squared scaling. But there's a variant of quantum Monte Carlo that is called, uh, called projector Monte Carlo, where I just start from a trial state, and I project out the ground state from a fixed trial state. 
or what it means basically is I take the path integral and I make the boundaries open. I don't close the trace, I just leave the boundaries open. When I leave the boundaries open, then the trajectory can start in one minimum, can tunnel through and end up in the other minimum. Now I pay the cost only of one instanton. It's only half the cost. And one would now expect that the rate should be faster. It should be the square. Oh, the, yeah, and, okay, so, uh, and the time indeed it turns out now the time scales beautifully with one over the gap instead of one over gap squared. So with the, 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 the periodic boundary conditions, I find the same scaling as a physical quantum annealer, but in quantum Monte Carlo I can cheat by cutting open the, the trace and then I can scale better and I get a quadratic speed up for the simulated quantum annealer for the classical algorithm over the quantum approach. Now this is for the tunneling through a barrier. What about the Grover search problem? Because now I could say, hey, but now I, I'm saying um, a simulated quantum annealer works better than a physical quantum annealer, so should we give up? And the answer is no, maybe not, because that's all. So, but I think what this shows is that just saying that we can tunnel more easily through a barrier than climbing over it, and that's why a quantum annealer is better, this is just the wrong picture. Because for this tunneling, my quantum Monte Carlo code scales better than any quantum annealer. But if we look at the search problem, then the problem is actually finding the other state. And in the Grover problem, the gap closes like one over root n, which with the quantum A di diabetic Dicknager theorem would give you a scaling with the number of, of states. The quantum Monte Carlo, no matter whether I do my tricks or not, I just have to find that state, and th that time just has to be proportional to the number of possible states I can go to, so it's proportional to n no matter what I do. The, the cutting th things open does not help because now I'm searching and not tunneling. Now, for Grover, we know if I, or if I choose an optimal annealing schedule, then I can get the time down to 1 over gap. So I can outperform it, but that requires two ingredients that are not generic. I have to know the exact analytical form of the gap, and the gap is not allowed to depend on the solution. For the pure Grover problem, we know that. For no other problem do we know it. So the generic search type problem, it's one over gap squared, and it scales just like quantum Monte Carlo. Good, so with that, let's think again about what does this imply for quantum annealing. First of all, I think it shows that if you're limited by the tunneling through a barrier, or if you're limited by searching, then the simulated quantum annealer is actually a, rel is actually a good indicator for the performance of a true quantum annealing. The scaling for the t t t t t t tunnel, uh, no, no, the scaling is the same for the t t Grover type problem in the t t t t generic case. The scaling is the same for the flipping of spins for going through a barrier. In the case of the tunneling through a barrier, it can, it can even make it faster. Now, does that mean that something like D-Wave can never work, that we should stop building a quantum annealer, that we should f f forget uh, uh, about that and be happy that we have now a very fast quantum-inspired annealer? My answer is it's, it's a bit too early for that because I still want to check how does it look like for barriers in spin glasses. We're checking think, uh, that now we have our arguments that it should scale generically in the same way when you have Vettel pairs, so that the leading term, term the exp is the same. As long as the gap becomes exponentially small. 
But in a quantum annealer, you can also make it non-stochastic. When you make it non-stochastic, then there's no quantum of the color method I could map it to. So now you have a quantum annealer that I can't simulate. But I can simulate the stochastic version of it. But now the question is, can I make it perform more efficiently by adding dynamics that's non-stochastic? And I don't think we know the answer yet. That's one thing to explore. And that will probably, if we want it on a big system, that will mean we have to build a nice, coherent quantum annealer with non-stochastic terms. So yes, we should build one just to answer that question. The next one is that Matt Hastings had a paper where he showed that generically quantum Monte Carlo dynamics can be much, much slower, can be exponentially slower than a quantum annealer. These arguments were, first of all, for a problem where there's a large gap that stays large. In which case, he made problems where the quantum Monte Carlo can get exponentially stuck in some topological sector somewhere. It's like having winding numbers. But by cutting open the temporal boundary conditions, that's easy. He still constructed other problems where adding more states to it, he, one might be able to, one might be stuck. That's what we have to look into. Where do, do the, these uh, the problems occur? Are they really there in real problems? And where can we find a problem where we see a big difference? So here, these are more questions than answers now. But to make sure that the quantum annealer is worthwhile building, I think we have to now look for reasons, for ways to outperform our quadratic classical speed up. So the summary is watch the time steps, beware of the tails, and when you tunnel through barriers, you better do it quantum inspired. Thank you. Questions for Matthias? Yeah. Yeah. So besides big fat barriers, there's also the problem um, that has been analyzed where you have like lots of like thin spikes, like you kind of have to go through a comb of narrow barriers, but there's just a lot of them and like yeah. quantum aided better computer can get like stuck in those cases too. Do you have any sense if quantum Monte Carlo, how it's going to deal with that kind of situation? Eddie might know what I'm talking about. So, yeah. so you have lots of spikes of fixed height? Um, or of growing height? Yeah. Um, yes. I don't remember. Okay. I don't either. So uh, I think if, <laughs> the, if the tunneling rate through the spikes gets smaller as they increase the problem size and then it's similar, when, when I just get more spikes, then I, know, I don't know, but it would be, be, be nice to find such a problem. Now, in the spin glasses, there have been arguments that the number of spikes should grow with the log of the problem size. So it's not many. It's very, very few, in fact. It's just log n barriers that you go through. And I don't know any kind of spin problem we could try that has so many barriers. If you find one or have one, then please tell me. Because I want to find a reason to kill my arguments here. Please help me. <laughs> Great. Let's thank Matthias one more time.